the Trappings and Trinkets Knitting Podcast, and I'm your host, Nicole. Uh, welcome. If you're a new viewer, thank you for stopping by and checking me out. And if you have been here before, welcome back. I'm very glad to uh, be able to catch up with you and spend a little more time together. So I'm wearing this very odd ensemble today of a sundress with a brioche winter scarf because this is my first finished object. This is the brioche cowl from the brioche hat and cowl pattern set that was published by Pearl Soho. And this is my second brioche project of my life. Um, the first one I did, or the first project that used a little brioche was the boho shawl. Um, that was one color brioche. So this is the first time I've done two color brioche and it was even easier. So I, I mean, I, on the one hand, I kind of understand why people get worked up about brioche because it is a stitch that is more difficult to fix if you make a mistake. Um, but just kind of like doing a complicated lace pattern, if you are worried about making a mistake and having to pull the whole thing out, just put in a lifeline and it should be fine. <laughs> um, I will say I did, well, no, it wasn't on this. It was on the, um, the boho shawl that when I was in the brioche section, I did make a mistake. Um, I had a hole, I had to drop back down and ladder up and it is way more complicated with brioche stitch, but I did it and that was the very first brioche project I had ever done. So I would encourage you if, you, if brioche is on your knitting bucket list and you think that you might like to give it a try, go ahead. It's, it is yarn overs, it is slip stitches, and it is either knit two together or purl two together. That's it. That is, there is nothing more complicated than those three things. So if you are comfortable with those three things, you should be fine with brioche. Uh, the brioche hat and cowl pattern is very well written. It's very clear. It gives enough of an explanation of what to do that I didn't have to use any outside resources, no videos, no help from friends. Um, it's very well written. It gave me a nice finished product. I'll show you up close here. So one side has the um, blue as the background color and the um, like the beige-ish as the the popping out color and on the other side it is the opposite. So as I look at this I can tell you one thing that I absolutely like I suspected this before I started the project but I absolutely proved to myself that the less ends that you have to weave in on a brioche project, you're really going to be better off. Um, it, I don't get too worked about, up about weaving in ends on most projects, but because everything shows, and on brioche there really is no wrong side, um, it's really hard to weave in ends. So basically I, I ended up doing like a duplicate stitch. For most of those spots, let me, and I had a lot of ends. I probably had 10 different spots where I was weaving in ends. So let me find one real quick. It probably won't take long because they do stick out. Oh, here's one. Okay, so let's see. So you can see on that side, it's a little irregular in that spot. But that's not even the side I wove it in on. It's this side. So it's right here that I was weaving all that in. So you can see that. It, I mean, it doesn't look terrible, but it sticks out if you're looking for it. Um, we'll see. Now Now that I've said they stick out, I'm not going to be able to find them. <laughs> oh, here's, a, here's one more um, right there. Whoops, where'd it go? There's on the front side. It's right here, right there. And then on the back side where I actually wove in the end, it's right there. So that one, I guess I, I hid a little bit better. Um, but anyway, if you can just work with a full skein of yarn and you know, if it's a two skein project, if you can just put that one end in the middle to weave in, maybe try to hide it in the back of the, the scarf or whatever, that um, is gonna be ideal. You don't want any more ends to weave in than you absolutely have to have. Uh, the yarn I used for this was Anzula Cricket and it is glorious. It is an MCN blend and that cashmere really makes a difference. It's very soft. Um, I will have no problem at all wearing this against my neck 
and I'm really, really sensitive. So even though this has a high wool content, that cashmere really softens it up and helps um, to make it wearable for people with sensitive skin. So, and Zula, you're doing beautiful things with yarn. I really love this Cricut and I think it made a really nice cowl here. So one project finished. I have two finished objects today. The second finished object that I have to show you is my husband's sweater. And I know it's giant, so you probably can't see it very well. <laughs> but this is called the Bespoken Sweater. And it's got a big shawl collar, so when it's on, it looks more like that. Um, this is the one that has, was eating my hands away <laughs> as of the last podcast. Um, I'm using Drops Nepal yarn, and that is a wool alpaca blend. And I am the first to admit I'm very sensitive to alpaca in particular. So by no, no means do I mean to say that because it doesn't work well for me that it shouldn't well, work well for other people. I'm sure there's plenty of people that can wear alpaca. I am not one of them. Um, last time I podcasted, I had a big hole in my, well, not a hole, but like a big open wound on my finger from the finger that the yarn comes over to tension it. Um, I had knit about two and a half skeins in one day, and it, it wasn't the friction. It was the oil or whatever. It was something in the yarn that was actually eating my skin away. Usually I can work with yarn, even if I can't wear it. This this yarn was an exception to that rule. Um, but I did find out that if I worked with the project and then I went and washed my hands right away, then I was okay. Um, and the uh, Aaron, the woman that owns my local yarn shop was saying, well, um, maybe whatever was in the yarn, like dyeing chemicals or, you know, oil from the, the llama or the alpacas or whatever, um, maybe once you block it, it won't, won't bother you as much anymore. But um, yesterday I was sewing the buttons on in the very last stage of making the sweater and I had already blocked the entire sweater without the buttons on it. So it was washed. Um, when I went to sew the buttons on, maybe I worked with it for an hour or so. And then my family, we went out to dinner and while I was sitting there at the restaurant, I started getting these welts all over my arms. And I, I do actually take a Zyrtec every day because just of allergies. Um, and if I don't take that Zyrtec, I will get welts on my skin. So I was sitting there at dinner thinking, well, gosh, usually like, usually I don't get those welts if I take that every 24 hours. And I'm sure I took it last night. And then it occurred to me, no, I'm getting them on my hands and arms. And that was the, pl you know, the places that were touching the sweater that I was just working with. And I forgot to wash my hands before we went out to dinner. So if you want to work with it and you're sensitive, just try to wash your hands after every time you do it and hopefully it won't eat your skin away. <laughs> so enough about the yarn, let's talk about the sweater. So I am very happy with the way this sweater turned out. It is beautifully cabled on the front. Uh, back is just stockinette stitch. Let me tell you, I re-knit this back. This is a 48 inch men's chest. So this is a, like a men's extra large. I knit this back piece three times. <laughs> three times! So the first time I knit it, it was five inches too big. <laughs> so instead of being 24 inches wide, it was 29 inches wide. So I wanted a 48 inch sweater. I didn't want a 53 inch sweater. That would, that would have been at least another size up. So that was not gonna work. So I pulled that out. I re-knit it while we were at a band competition um, a couple weekends ago. And because I had knit the sleeves in between the fronts and this back, like I had done the two fronts, the back, the two sleeves, then realized the back was too big. <laughs> then I frogged the back. So when I started over on the back, I didn't, look at the direction that said how tall the ribbing was supposed to be. Um, but I had in my mind that it was three inches because I had just done the sleeves and the cuffs on the sleeves are three inches. Unfortunately, the two front pieces, the ribbing at the bottom was two inches tall. So 
I re-knit this entire back. All I looked at on the pattern was how, how many stitches do you cast on? And then I was off and running. So actually, I take it back. I didn't re-knit the entire back. I re-knit it up to the, like, where the armhole bind off was going to be. And once I got there, I think I was holding my partial back piece up to one of my front pieces to make sure that I had the same number of rows before I bound off for the underarm so that when I sewed it together, it would all line up. And I looked at the ribbing and I was like, the fronts do not match the back. <laughs> the fronts are much smaller than the back. So ripped it out again and started over. This time I had two inches of ribbing so it would all match up. And I mean, it was worth it in the end, but let me tell you, I, by the time I re-knit that back for the third time, I was like, if I never see this yarn again, <laughs> it will be too soon. The collar on this, let's see, I showed you, it is a big shawl collar that will fold behind the neck and it meets here in a V-neck where it has a button, like, you know, button starts about right here. Um, so the collar, I, I re-knit the collar slash button bands because that's all connected. I had to re-knit that once, so I did the whole thing following the directions. The collar was like 14 inches long on the back, and so it like, it even folded over. It was definitely up onto his head. It was not neck tall. So I pulled that all out. I looked at the pattern. I did some calculations and I can't figure out because they do say at the end of the shawl collar section, it says shawl collar should be about nine inches tall. Then that's not folded over. So four and a half inches, that's, you know, for a high collar, that's a normal size for a man's sweater. Um, but the, the way I did it the first time where it was over seven inches tall, that was not a normal size. So um, I, you know, I looked at that instruction, okay, nine inches tall, and then I did some math to figure out well, how many rows are they actually instructing me to work here, and when I calculated it all out, it was like, it was giving me a collar height of about 12 or 13 inches, so I just couldn't figure out how exactly it's supposed to end up nine inches, so at that point, I decided I just had to kind of figure it out for myself, so um, in the pattern, it does have you place some markers. It has you place two markers at either side of the neck bind off. This is as you're picking up stitches for the collar. So there's two, two markers back here, and then there's two markers right here. This is where the V-neck ends, and it goes into straight knitting. So basically what happens is as you're knitting this shawl collar, it has you going from, uh, like, across all those back neckline stitches. So you're going across, you're wrapping and turning, you're coming back to this marker and going across, or going past it, wrapping and turning, going back across, wrap, or working in the wrap, and then wrapping and turning the next stitch. And you're doing that back and forth so that you're basically wrapping and turning every stitch as you go down your neckline on either side. And um, then as you get about halfway down, they have you skipping some stitches and still doing wraps and turns until you get to those last markers where you're gonna, where your sweater starts going straight down. So instead of doing that, I had to do a little math and um, I didn't start wrapping and turning right away after the markers. I really went down about, I wanna say it was like 18 stitches or something like that. So I would, I would knit those back neckline stitches and about 18 stitches on the neckline, wrap and turn, and then I'd go this way, down 18 stitches, wrap and turn, and then I would do every stitch, wrap and turn. Um, and then as I got closer to these markers down here, then I would skip a couple. Um, but I ended up doing a lot less rows than what they were instructing in the pattern. And as you can see, I still came out with a sizable collar. So, I mean, I wouldn't want a collar any taller than that. Um, the other thing that I did that was a little bit of a modification from the pattern is that you can see this is where I picked up stitches. So that's where the body of the sweater ends. And for these first few rows, let's see, I did it for about six rows. I used stockinette stitch. 
And the reason for that is because when you fold this over, if you look in the project pictures on the pattern, you'll see that you can see the ribbed, like the ribbed collar is sticking out underneath this fold. Because of the way the shoulders are done on this sweater, they are, um, they're not bound off all at the same time, the shoulder stitches. It, they bind them off, I think, over three rows. So you'll bind off about a third of them, keep knitting. Buy, go back, bind off another, the middle third, keep knitting, go back, and then bind off the last third. So because it's stair-stepped that way, um, the back, that, that drops the neckline down a little bit farther. And so when you start knitting this collar, the collar is starting about maybe an inch and a half down your back. It's not up on the neckline height. So I didn't love how that looked in the pictures. So I just thought, well, I'll just, I'll just make it stockinette for that first part. And that way when I do fold the collar, or when my husband folds the collar over, um, it's going to, disguise, well not disguise, you're just not going to see the ribbed stuff. It's actually going to be a folded collar and the collar is going to hide the back of the collar. By the way, it does have a schematic. Hooray, I love that. Thank you for providing that. Um, the collar is not included in the schematic, so that would have been nice. That would have been an easy thing to see the, I would have liked to see the height of that collar on the schematic because that's where I would look for measurements. I did find it eventually in the body you know, in the instructions, um, but it, when I'm looking for measurements on a sweater at a glance, I like to see them on a schematic. So for what it's worth, you might think about putting that, designers, put those in the schematics. The other thing that I modified, and this was just per my husband's taste, is that when he tried the sweater on, um, he decided it was just a little bit snugger than what he wanted, so I made the button band about twice as wide. But honestly, it's a it's a men's extra large sweater. Um, normally, I wouldn't do like a three or four inch button band on one of my sweaters, but on a men's extra large, proportionally, it really doesn't look that big. So that's fine. Um, the last thing I really do like a lot about this sweater is the way the buttonholes were made. These are horizontal buttonholes, and that means they are done over a three row pattern. So the first pattern, you bind off a couple stitches and then you do a knit two together or a purl two together for the last bound off stitch. You do that on all of them. And then as you come back on the next row, you are casting on one stitch more than you bound off. So for example, if you bind off two stitches and then do a knit two together, you've actually bound off three stitches. You've gotten rid of three. So on the net, on the row on the way back up, you're going to cast on four stitches for each buttonhole. And the way they did that on this pattern was by, you would knit, knit or purl, whatever. I'm, I was working in two by two rib. So you'd work up to the buttonhole. You would turn your work, just, and that literally just means what it, what it says. You just, like you're holding it like this, now you're going to hold it like this. Just turn it around so you're looking at the opposite side. And then I used a, what's it called, knitted cast on to cast on four stitches. And then you turn it back around. So now I'm looking at the original side. Keep knitting and purling to get to the next buttonhole. Turn the work around. Cast on four stitches with the knitted cast on. Turn it back around. So it was a lot of turning back and forth just on that one row. But whatever, that's fine. Um, and then on this third row, as you approach the buttonhole, the very first thing you're going to do is knit one of your existing button band stitches together with your first cast on stitch from row two. So you're either going to knit that together or purl that together, depending on where you are in the two by two rib pattern. And then you just continue that pattern over the next three stitches, and then you should come up even with whatever you know knit or purl stitches next as you keep knitting the button band and then you're going to meet another buttonhole group of stitches so you're going to knit or purl the first or yeah the, the stitch that you're looking at from the button band together with the first cast on stitch keep knitting and purling in pattern 
and then you're going to get back to the buttonholes, uh, the button band stitches, and continue that pattern. So I'm, I know that was a, uh, a crazy explanation. That was a lot of an explanation. I believe that it's just referred to as three row button hole instructions. So I bet if you Googled that, and maybe I'll try to come up with something that I can link in the show notes. It's a really nice, neat looking way to do buttonholes. Here, I'll show you a couple. Um, but they're just very nice looking. And the buttons that we picked out, we just got from Joanne, Joanne Fabrics. So they're just like a brown kind of natural looking wood, but they are finished and sealed. So we'll be able to wash those. Um, like everything handmade, I will only hand wash the sweater uh, because it, I don't think it's super wash either. So I wouldn't, I would hope that nobody would put this in the uh, washer. But I certainly won't just because I don't like the pilling that comes from machine washing. I'm really happy with the way this turned out. I would recommend this for maybe a, an intermediate sweater knitter. I wouldn't recommend it for your first sweater. Um, but, you know, because it does have cables. It does have short rows. Um, it did have some fudging and a little bit of refiguring numbers for me. Um, it also had sewing in of sleeves and sewing front and back pieces together. So all of those skills, to me, that adds up to at least an interme intermediate knit. For some people, they might feel like this is a, like a, uh, what's beyond intermediate, like an expert knit, <laughs> a challenging knit. Um, I have a hard time calling almost any knitting project like expert level because I feel like you, you're always going to learn something from whatever project you take on. So to think that you have to have all the skills going in, I think is like, that's, that's just silly. So you don't need to have all the skills going in. If you've never sewn pieces together, well, now you're going to learn. <laughs> you're going to look up mattress stitch. And you're going to figure it out. So I, I, I can't say that it's an expert thing. It's, it's not a beginner knit. It's a person that is ready to learn or that has some skills. That's who should be knitting this sweater. So um, I am going to be giving this to my husband tonight, even though he's pretty much, I didn't let him see the final version with the buttons on, but he's tried it on a few times down, you know, as, as it's being made. So um, today's his birthday. So he's going to get his sweater. So I'll see if I can get him to put it on later tonight when we, um, give him his gifts and um, maybe I'll put a, a video or some photos in here so that you can see it modeled on a body. Um, boy. This is perfect for this nice cool day. Oh. Should I button it? Shall I button it? Yeah. Oh, I'm not dying at all <laughs> of heat exhaustion. <laughs> Let's go outside. You look very jaunty. <laughs> jaunty is the word you're using? Go play a game of cricket. You missed a button, you skipped a hole. Yeah. <laughs> this is how I'm gonna wear it. You know, he has a early fall birthday in Illinois, and we're supposed to have a high of 90 degrees today. So I I'm gonna guess that he hasn't had a lot of birthdays that were 90 degree weather. Uh, but you know, why not put on an alpaca sweater? Because the people want to see it. <laughs> so anyway, that's the bespoken sweater and uh, good pattern, nice design, pretty well written. You know, most people will, will do fine with this pattern. So um, I was very happy with the way mine turned out. So those are my finished objects. I have some in progress. We have the lovely Calaluna sweater. And this is my Love is Love set. Um, for anybody that didn't catch it the first time, that is a Dream and Color co uh, color pack. It's a bunch of mini skeins of their Cosette base, which is a merino cashmere yarn. And it's beautiful and soft. And I think I will love wearing this sweater. So as you can see, it has a little bit of a curved hem in the back. And I'm knitting this long enough that I'll be able to wear it with leggings. So, you know, that might be about 18 or 19 inches from the underarm because I, 
I like to have my booty covered if I'm wearing some leggings. Um, right now, I am knitting it with the, with the knowledge that I'm probably going to end up ripping it out. So right now, I'm basically knitting an enormous gauge swatch that is the size of a sweater. And the reason I'm doing that is because I want to get through at least three or four solid balls. So this first one, I can't really use that for my math because of the curved hem. So it's not just going round and round. And this second color actually had a couple more short row. Uh, it, it participated a little bit in the short row business as well. So that's also not going to be a true measurement. So it wasn't until I got to this third color that I was actually just knitting round and round. And I can say, okay, here's how much I got out of that skein. Um, maybe that's one and three quarters inches. So what I'm trying to do is knit three or four full mini skeins so that I can say, okay, over these four mini skeins, I got nine inches of fabric. And I know I have, I'll have to count it again. I think there's nine mini skeins in there. So I'll have to do the math and say, okay, if I have nine inches for four skeins, that's two and a quarter inches for each skein. So my nine skein should give me this many inches of torso. Um, what I think I'm coming up against is that I'm not going to have enough of the rainbow colors to get all the way above my bust. And when I was first knitting this, I was thinking, well, who cares if I just get to under my bust, then I can make this whole top part and the sleeves the gray color that I have on order. But the more I knit this and the more I think about it, I really do want to bring the rainbow colors all the way up to almost to the neckline. Um, that's the way the original pattern was written and I think that's how I want this to look. So what I'm gonna do after I do all those calculations is say, okay, let's say I come out with 17 and a half inches. I, I think that the rainbow colors are gonna get me 17 and a half inches of body length. So what I'm going to do is say, okay, I want a 19 inch body length, but I'm only gonna get 17 and a half inches. That means I have one and a half inches missing and I'm gonna take that gray yarn and make up for it in the body of the sweater. So once I get the gray yarn, when I re-knit this, I'm probably gonna have one or two rows of gray in between each color section, and that's gonna make up that extra you know, couple inches that I'm gonna to need to get the body as high up as I want it. And I also, like the more I think about it, the more I think, oh, that's also gonna really tie these colors nicely together with the dark gray that's gonna be the sleeves and the very top of the sweater. Um, so I really don't mind that at all. I, I actually think that's a better color design to have a little bit of the gray woven in throughout the rainbow colors uh, to just kind of make it all look like one, one well thought out piece. So this is right now, this is like my mindless knitting when I don't want to think about things. Like if I'm sitting be waiting for a volleyball game to start, maybe I'll have this with me just so I can keep knitting a few more rows. And it looks like one, two, three, I have three skeins, three full mini skeins right here. And so I might do one more before I wash it, block it, do the math, and then pull it all out again to wait for the gray yarn. Um, but I, you know, as I knit this, I won't mind at all re-knitting this because this yarn is so beautiful to work with. I love it. So Cal Luna is actually going really well despite the fact that I know I'm gonna be re-knitting it. Um, whatever, you know, I told you a couple of podcasts ago that I don't really knit gauge swatches very often. Sometimes I knit whole projects that turn out to be gauge swatches. And that, you know, it, it wasn't exactly intentional on this one, but it wasn't, I wasn't very far into it where I started to suspect, um, I don't think I'm going to have enough yarn to get the full length that I want. So after about the second uh, mini skein, it really was intentional. I knew that I was knitting it just to be able to measure it and then pull it back out. So Knitting those gauge swatches pretty big, but whatever, it's going to come out with a nice sweater in the end. So we're done with knitting. Let's talk about sewing. So this is actually a no-sew project. 
I showed you this, um, this fabric a while back, maybe a week or two ago. I got this really nice, cute, very soft wool-ish fabric from Joann's. And I made this blanket scarf with it. And it's just very warm and cozy. And basically all you do to make a blanket scarf is create fringe. And creating fringe off of a piece of woven fabric is just about the easiest thing you can do. So what you do is you take a seam ripper and you look at the edge of your fabric here and you just stick the seam ripper in. Let me see if I can get a little closer. Stick the seam ripper in and try to catch the very bottom horizontal running thread of black. Because as you can see, the brown thread is up and down. The black thread, which is what's making this pattern, is going side to side. So you just catch that with your seam ripper, whoop, and then you pull it out with your fingers. Just pull it all the way out of the fabric. And that exposes a little bit more of the brown fringe. And then you go to the next black thread and you pull that one out of the fabric. And then the next one and pull that out. So maybe on each of these four sides, I had to pull out 40 threads or something. Um, I probably worked on it for three hours total. Like it, it does take some time, but it is not difficult. This is like, you know, watch a TV show, make yourself a scarf. So I thought that turned out really nicely. And I am sure I will get tons of use from that once the weather cools off. The other sewing project that I was busy with all afternoon yesterday uh, was tailoring a homecoming skirt. So my daughter went with the two-piece sort of homecoming dress. Not a dress, it's a skirt and a top. So she picked out this really cute skirt, but it was a a size, like a solid size bigger than her actual body was. Um, but, oh, that's okay. She has a mom that sews. So I was like, oh, it'll be no big deal. I can take the waist in. Let's still get this skirt. And then as part of this bargain, she was, she was kind of wavering between two different skirts. One of them had pockets and it didn't fit her very well. Like it just, it, and it wasn't a thing where I could just make it fit better. It was just a poorly made skirt like the the fabric was this really puffy polyester that did not take pleats very well but it was a pleated skirt so the pleats were sewn in at the top and then they just kind of like puffed out because the fabric would not keep the crease in it so that skirt was a disaster but it had pockets <laughs> so she was kind of like well I really like the pockets on this one but yeah I, I think that one looks nicer but I really like the pockets so as part of our bargain, I said, well, if you if you like the way this skirt looks better, I will make at least one pocket for you in this skirt when I modify, or, you know, when I take in the, the waist. So I had to make good on my promise. So it does have a pocket now. I put a little pocket in the side. And for that, all I did was go to Joann's and buy like some very plain black, black fabric. And you kind of, you cut it into like a kidney shape, kidney shape, kind of. Like it has to be flat here on the side where you're going to sew it to the, the fabric of the skirt itself. But then you kind of want it to be rounded as it drops down into the skirt. And then I thought I would be able to just take it in on one side. But then I realized, oh, look, these pleats, they're centered on the body. So... The front has this pleat right here that's supposed to be centered and then the two side pleats. So I couldn't just take it in on one side or else the skirt would look like this when it was on her body. So I had to take it in on both sides and um, that was not really an easy feat. So you can see where I did that. This, when I originally took the skirt apart, this line was nicely lined up with the uh, seam of the skirt. But let me tell you, this thing is black. Nobody's going to be staring at her side. So I was not particularly worried about lining it up exactly with the, um, with the, the seam of the skirt itself. But this, this skirt has a lining, and that is not attached to the front of the waistband. So these are two separate pieces. 
And then at the two points where I took it apart, the sides were not attached. So now I have four separate pieces all open. And then I have the front fabric of the dress and I have the lining fabric of the dress. So basically it was really no big deal to take it apart, but then to put it together with these six pieces all meeting right there on the seam was kind of a nightmare. <laughs> So that's why it took me so long. I, it really took me like probably four solid hours I was working on this. Uh, but it turned out really nicely. And I think she'll just be adorable for her homecoming dance next week. Um, another tailoring thing that I found out last week, because she has a backpack that has this weird like Y-shaped zipper. So the flap is up here. It has two zippers that meet in the middle. The front of the backpack has a zipper that meets it here. So it's kind of a Y-shape. So anyway, one of those front top flap zippers, the fob broke off and then the zipper was actually pulling out of the bag a little bit. So I'm pretty good at sewing, but I looked at this thing and I was like, I don't, I don't even know where to start with this. So um, we do have a very good tailor in town. So I called up her shop and they said, well, actually we do not repair bags of any kind because we don't have machines that can uh, repair curved objects. So I guess what they're saying is garments only, please don't bring us your purses or your backpacks or whatever. But she said, you could try a shoe repair shop because they do have the machines that would be able to do that. So I went to a shoe repair shop, uh, one town over, and the person there wanted to take out the zipper, all three zippers actually, and replace them with, okay, so let me start, let me back up for a second. So the zippers that are on this backpack have the large pulls, similar to this, but they're actually even larger than this. And when I went to the first shoe repair person, he wanted to put in a little baby garment zipper like this. And so I was saying, uh, I don't know, that that just doesn't, like that's not very backpacky. I, I can see my daughter trying to open this backpack with this teeny tiny little zipper pull and I was like, no, that's not gonna work. So then I went to a different shoe repair shop and this is one in, that's in Peoria that I've actually gone there before and I should have gone there in the first place but the other place was closer so I just thought I'd take a chance. But this place, like, they really know what they're doing. This guy was like, I don't even need to repair that zipper. I'll just sew it back in, and then I'll replace the fob. Ta-da, it's done. So I was like, okay, that sounds really good. And he had it done. Like, he told me a week, and I was fine with that. And then I got an email, like, two hours later, he had finished it. <laughs> and when my, so I sent my husband, because he works in Peoria, and uh, when he picked it up, the guy told him, well, you know, it was a large object. I like to get those out of my way first because they're just taking up more space. So I guess I'm, I should be happy that we had a big backpack to take in. <laughs> so he wanted to get that off of his shelf as soon as possible. So if you ever have a backpack or a handbag that is in really good shape, but something breaks on it, take it to a shoe repair shop. They will probably be able to help you out, especially if you're in the Peoria area, take it to Fred's shoe repair shop. They will definitely be able to help you out. That, that place, they've repaired shoes for me and now they've done a backpack for me and I have never been anything but completely happy with the work they do. So I highly recommend if you're in central Illinois, go on over to Fred's shoe repair if you need any sort of shoe or bag repair work done. So while I was working on the tailoring yesterday, my husband was outside. Um, we have a underground pet fence. A lot of people have those for their dogs. We have one for our cats. <laughs> so we live in a town that has um, animals at large laws. I, I didn't grow up in a town like this. So to me, this seems very strange that people are worried about cats being out. Like I totally get it. With, with dogs, especially bigger dogs, like that's intimidating to walk down the street and see a big dog coming with no human around. The, you know, that can be worrisome. Um, with cats, I don't get too worked up about cats outside. And as a person that has cats, like we used to have cats that would come over in our yard. They knew that cats lived here. So sometimes they'd come right up to the screen door and our cats would be mad about it and they'd be hissing 
like okay that's the circle of life that's part of part of the world is animals so it didn't bother me like if i didn't want the cat standing at my door all you have to do is go out on the porch and yell at it and it would run away <laughs> so i so i'm a little bit i kind of roll my eyes about the cats at large laws but i live in a place with cats at large laws and i have a, a neighbor who was very concerned about my cats being in her yard because she was afraid that they were going to try to catch the birds that were coming to her bird feeder. So we ended up putting a underground cat fence and thank goodness this all happened when my cats were less than a year old. So they were still young enough that they were pretty trainable. And if you've ever, like, if you have cats, you might be laughing at me <laughs> because you think how trainable are cats? They really are trainable you can train them if you get them young enough. Um, so my cats have, ter like, they have terrible behavior in some aspects. In fact, we ended up having to, at about age seven, we ended up having to declaw them because I tried and tried for seven years to try to get them to stop destroying all of our furniture and I just wasn't successful. So I did a terrible job training them on that aspect, but I did train them to not mess with my yarn while I'm knitting. <laughs> so I guess that was just something that was reinforced every day when they were young. They would sit on my lap, they would lay next to me, I would be knitting. If they tried to touch the yarn, I would, you know, not let them sit there, I would scold them, whatever. I was giving them negative feedback when that happened. So now I can knit and I can have like a piece of yarn that's like going right across my cat's head and they won't mess with it. Now, if I leave a ball of yarn on the floor, they will bat it around and play with it. They will chase yarn if we pull yarn around the house for them to chase, but they won't go after yarn that I'm actually working with. So they are trainable. So anyway, as I was saying, luckily they were young when we put this cat fence in um, because with a pet fence, you do use a collar that gives them a shock. It, it gives them a warning sound first, so it beeps when they're getting close to the border. And then if they continue closer to the border, it will shock them. And the collars that we have, you can set it anywhere from like a one to a three or a one to a five, where it's a very, uh, five would be a very intense shock. Three or one would be, you know, just enough of a thing to remind them they're not supposed to do that. So um, when they were young and we were teaching them to use this fence, we, my husband installed the fence, but... I'm the one that taught them how to use it. So I actually put them, I put the collar on them and then I also had them in one of those like harnesses that you would normally see a dog in where it goes around their arms and then like the leash goes, it uh, clips to their back, well the, the loop that is uh, over their back. And I would have to run up to where the border was and that was marked with some flags so they could visually see where the, the limit was. I would run with them with the leash and then when we got close to the border their little collar would start to beep and I would say no run and then we would run back to the house. So this whole time I'm kind of leading them with the leash like okay let's go up to the border oh no your collar is beeping run away and then we would run back to the house. So that's how you teach an animal to use one of these underground fences. You have to reinforce that when they hear that beeping that's a danger sound and they can't be there. So run back to the house. This is where it's safe. So what I found though, is that a lot of people will say that once a dog understands where their border is and where their yard is, that it's not really necessary to put their collar on. Or, you know, maybe you would do it sometimes, but you wouldn't have to put their collar on every time they'd be outside because they were trained. They would know where they're supposed to stay. Cats, if you have a cat, you know what I'm talking about. Cats are like, oh yeah, that beep, it's coming from the collar. So if you're not going to put the collar on me, I can go wherever I want. So, you know, a couple years into this, I started testing to see, because they were very good, they would stay in our yard. So I would start to test them and not put their collar on, but then kind of watch to see where they were going. And I tell you, like the first time I didn't put that collar on, they were like, and now I can go to the neighbor's yard. <laughs> so with cats, you do have to put the collar on every single time. Now for a while here, 
we had some work done in our yard last fall. Uh, we dug up our driveway and had a new driveway installed. And after that was done, the, um, the pet fence we, we put underneath the driveway in like a PVC pipe to protect it. So once that was done, the fence was still working, it was fine. But somewhere, probably in the winter, it stopped working. And neither one, like my husband and I, neither one of us really know, like nothing seemed to have happened. There wasn't any sort of digging in the yard. There wasn't, like, we don't think that it was that moisture got to it or, like, it's a pretty, um, a pretty protected cord that goes all the way around the yard. So we really didn't know what the problem was. So my husband didn't fix it right away. And we would, we continued to put the collars on the cats and let them outside. So they still had the feeling of like, oh, I have to behave myself because I'm wearing this thing that's going to make that noise and it's going to shock me if I go too far. Um, and for all of the winter, it was fine. Spring, summer, it was fine. Um, recently, we have, we have a neighbor on the other side of us that put up a fence. And when that happened, I was like, now the cats are going to be curious about this fence and they're going to want to go investigate it and it's past their where they know their border is. So once they get curious enough and they try to go over there to see what's going on, they're going to realize that those collars are not making the noise that they used to make and that now they're going to think, oh, it's fine. I can go wherever I want. So I think this happened because about a week and a half ago, my husband went outside to call the cats in and he found one of our cats in the road laying underneath the teenager car that my son drives. <laughs> so the road is past the boundary, so he should not have been there. And then a couple days after that, I went outside to call the cats in and uh, one of the cats came through the bushes and that was on the side where the, he had been in the neighbor's yard that doesn't like the cats to come and look at her bird feeders. So at that point, I was like, all right, these cats can't be outside until we figure out the cat fence. So my husband did repair it. I, we don't know what happened. It was, the, the problem was underneath the driveway, so don't know what happened there. But he fixed it, and then he stuck the new wire, like, into the crack uh, that goes between the driveway and the apron of the driveway. So now we have that stuff down in the crack, but whatever, it works. <laughs> A couple other final things. I wanted to thank everyone who has entered the giveaway drawing so far. Um, it, the way that you enter it is by going to episode 17, not this episode, and um, leave any comment on episode 17. And um, that will enter you for a chance to win this skein of Christmas yarn and matching project drawstring bag. Um, the second way that you can enter to win is to go to the Trappings and Trinkets Ravelry group. There is a thread for episode 17, and I think in the title of that thread it says giveaway. So if you leave any comment in that giveaway thread, you are also entered. And the third way is to go to the iTunes, um, the, wherever you find this podcast on iTunes, and leave a review for the Trappings and Trinkets Knitting Podcast. Um, anyone that leaves a review after whatever day the last episode 17 was published, it was probably September 6th or something like that. So any reviews that I see after that date are going to be entered to win this giveaway. So if you want to win the Christmas yarn and Christmas bag, uh, go to one of those three places. And if you want to go to all three places, you, you can have three chances to win. So it's been really fun to read all the comments that you're leaving. And I was going to respond to some of them in today's episode, but I like this is a super long episode. So I'm going to save that for next time. Episode 19 is where we're actually going to see who the winner is for that giveaway. I am not a, I'm not a giveaway person who will chase down the winners. If you win a giveaway, you have to let me know who you are and what your address is, and I'll, I'll give you that information of how you can contact me, um, but I'm not going to chase down people because, I honestly, I want to give these things away to people who are supporting my podcast. So if you're a person that just, you know, threw a comment up there because you, one of your friends told you to, but then you never watch the podcast, 
I would rather that prize go to someone who does watch a podcast. So um, episode 19, that's where you find out if you're the winner. One of the comments that I do want to respond to, though, is that I made the comment because um, I, I wasn't giving you any prompt. Like I, I said, leave any comment. But then I said, no, wait, leave something nice. Don't tell me that my kitchen's a mess or that my hair looks terrible or whatever. And I did not at all mean that, that I think my kitchen is a mess or that I think my hair is terrible. The reason I said that is because I was just saying like, be nice. Like I'm a human, just like you're a human. So if you leave some crappy comment that is overly critical and just mean, then you're not entered for the giveaway. <laughs> so that is all I meant by that. I am not worried about the state of my kitchen or the state of my hair. Um, so that's very nice of those of you that were reassuring me that my hair was fine and my kitchen was fine. Um, but that I, I totally misrepresented, I think, what I was actually trying to say with that. What I was saying was, don't be a jerk. If you're a jerk in the comments, you're not entered to win. <laughs> um, so the other comments I will respond to this next episode in episode 19. In the past, I have brought up current events. I've brought up political issues. And I bring those things up very carefully and with a lot of thought. And so I was thinking to myself, because there was something that happened yesterday that I was I was thinking a lot about. It was really on my mind. It was all over social media. And honestly, by the end of the day, I was so tired of reading about it because I was seeing the same couple of responses over and over and over. Like everybody fell into one or one of two camps. And so I was thinking, is this something that is worth talking about? Should I start it with saying, we're going to talk about current events. So if you're a person that has trouble listening to people's opinions on current events, now's the time to turn off the podcast. But then I thought, no, I, I'm not going to do that. I, I feel like I speak about these things so carefully and with so much thought that I don't feel like they need a warning. I am not speaking off the cuff about anything that I bring up that is current events slash political, any of that stuff. I have thought long and hard about what I want to say, and I am trying to say it in the most informative, least insulting, like it's never my, um, it's never my hope to insult people. It's my hope to inform, to share my opinion, to share my experience. So with that in mind, let's talk current events. <laughs> So I am not a sports person. This past Sunday, football games all over the country, there was a lot of athletes that were kneeling when the Star Spangled Banner, the national anthem, was being played. And if you're if you're a person outside of the outside of the U.S. that's watching this podcast, maybe you haven't heard about this, but this is like a major thing that people are talking about right now. So this has been happening for at least a year. Um, last year there was a quarterback who kind of really started this whole thing and he was very articulate about I am kneeling because I am protesting inappropriate police conduct and racial inequality. So there was never any mystery about why he was kneeling. He was up front from the very beginning. So there has been this back and forth about, well, is that your you're disrespecting the flag, you're disrespecting veterans. Um, should athletes be able to protest because that's their job? Um, those are the, the things that people who don't like this say. People that do like this or that are okay with it say um, he's, he's an athlete but he's also a citizen. He has a right to say what he thinks. They say he is a black man in America. He has a perspective that maybe a lot of white people don't have, and maybe we should be listening to him rather than criticizing. Um, basically, for that side, it comes down to he is a person. He should be able to, whatever he does peacefully, he should be able to do. So those two sides got real into it yesterday when a lot of teams decided to kneel while the national anthem was being played. And one team in particular um, didn't even come out on the field. They were in the locker room the whole time. So 
Um, I'm definitely a person that believes that if you are saying something peacefully, you should be able to say it. Um, I think that that's one of the tenets of having freedom, is the freedom of expression. So if I were to say, no, he shouldn't be able to kneel, then I would also have to say, um, you know, anybody else that has something I disagree with shouldn't be able to say that too. So I can't say that because I really value my ability to express myself. And so I would be a hypocrite if I didn't think that other people deserve that. Um, the thing that I wanted to talk about, though, was the stuff that I read regarding he's an athlete, he should be doing his job, and he shouldn't be protesting at work. I'm going to guess that besides, you know, there, I'm sure there's a few reasons that people become professional athletes. I'm sure it's because they love the game they're playing, and I'm sure it's because they make a boatload of money playing the game that they're playing. So those two things, I'm sure, are very high on the list. But I think there's a third thing for a lot of these athletes that really figures in to what they see as their role as a football player or a basketball player. I believe that they see themselves as someone that other kids, that, that other kids, because a lot of these people are kids. They are like in their early 20s, right? Or maybe even older teenagers. So these young men and women are looking at kids and knowing those kids are watching me. Those kids are modeling themselves after me. Those kids desire to have what I have, to become what I've become. And so they know that part of their role as a professional athlete in the public eye is that they are a role model to all of our kids. Now, there are a lot of athletes that do not meet that challenge of being a good role model. But how can we say we want these athletes to be role models, but then when they try to do something that is showing their character, that they are trying to stand up for something that they think is wrong, how can we say, no, you can't do that? So it's like, yes, my son looks up to you. He wants to be a football player just like you. Oh, but that thing that you're protesting, yeah, don't do that at work. Don't do that in front of people because right now you're just an athlete. You should just do your work. I, I think it's a whole package. So that is my main concern when I see people saying stuff along the lines of, they're at work, I can't protest at my work, so why should they be able to protest at, your, at their work? These athletes are being seen every week or a couple times a week by millions of people. They have a platform. They are already expected as part of their job to be a role model. And so this is how you do it. You do it by having the character to support things that are positive and to speak up when you see something that you think is having a negative impact on society. That is what being a role model is. So take it from this firstborn, oldest child, oldest, you know, in my, in my group of neighborhood friends, I was one, one of the two oldest kids. Um, I, I've been a teacher for many years. I take my job, my place as a role model very seriously. And so if I take it that seriously, I can imagine that other people take it just as seriously. So I think that what we need to be doing is to be saying, okay, these people are having a problem with something. Let's, let's listen to them. If they have something to say, let's listen. They're not hurting anyone. They're, they've not said anything about veterans. They've never said anything about disrespecting flags. To me, there is, there is nothing more respectful than peacefully exercising the freedom that that flag stands for. So there's my carefully articulated thoughts on that subject. I appreciate anybody that stuck around to hear them. And I am very curious um, how you feel about that. I I am getting weary of the, you know, those couple of arguments. So 
you're welcome to leave a comment with one of those arguments. I probably won't respond to it because I just said what I thought about that in this podcast. A friend of mine posted on Facebook yesterday, and um, in order to really understand this post, you need to know that he's a white guy. So this man posted, and I'm probably not going to quote it exactly right, but basically what he said was that the amount of time that he is going to spend being angry about athletes kneeling while the um, national anthem was being played is exactly equivalent to the amount of time that he has spent being a black man in America. So I feel the same way that he does. I couldn't possibly begin to understand what people who, who have a different skin color than me, who have a different life experience than me, I can't understand what they have gone through. So I can't stand in judgment of a life that I not only haven't lived myself, but I am not close to anyone who has lived that life. So I would encourage you to do the same. So that's all I have today for the uh, Knitting and Politics Podcast. <laughs> That's, I should just rename it the Knitting and Politics Podcast. I even got through it without talking about the current health care bill that hopefully is going to die soon in the uh, in America's Congress. I almost got through the podcast without mentioning it, but just couldn't resist. <laughs> uh, congratulations to you if you have hung in there with me. I appreciate uh, you spending your time with me, and I always enjoy talking with you. So please leave me a comment. I would love to respond to it in the next, I am planning on doing quite a few responses um, in episode 19. Also make sure you check back in episode 19, which is going to air at the very beginning of October, because that's where you're going to find out who the winner is of the Christmas yarn and the project bag. So episode 19, check it out. All right, I hope you have lots of fabulous knitting these next couple weeks. I hope you have a great time uh, with whatever you're doing, and I hope you spend a lot of time with your fiber arts. Thanks for spending time with me. I will see you next time. Bye!